Welcome to my video. Today we are going to talk about buying a bike. We are going to talk about types of mountain bikes. We are going to talk about major considerations you need to make and the different components and things that you need to understand before you jump into the market. We are going to talk about new versus used. We are going to talk about where to buy and we are going to talk about three different bikes. We'll get three bikes on the stand. We'll talk about an older used mountain bike, a more modern used mountain bike, and then a new mountain bike, and kind of walk through the range of what you get on that spectrum. So let's jump into it. All right, so we're gonna jump online here. I wanna, I wanna show you um, some of these visuals that I've worked up for you guys to kind of walk you through some of the basics of the mountain bike standards, the different categories of mountain bikes, and just all the details that you need to get out there and shop. First, I need to... A... Ah, a sip of our adult beverage. So let's jump into it. Here we go. So first, you need to understand the categories of bikes. Let's talk about um, the, the cross country first, which is going to be your XC bike, which is going to be, um, light trail work. Uh, a lot of guys race these. If you're going long distances, this is going to be your bike. A lot of hard tails in this category, um, less full suspension bikes, though. There's a lot of really nice cross country, full suspension, short travel, bikes out there today. And then you're going to get into trail bikes, which is going to be, um, you're going to be doing some more trail work. You're going to get into some more descents. You're going to have a, a fuller suspension travel. You're going to have a little bit more weight and it's going to be a little bit more durable bike than your cross country bike. And then you get into enduro, which is going to be, um, between trail and downhill going to have a little bit heavier way in most cases, it's going to have uh, more suspension travel and more durability than your trail bikes. And then you get into a downhill bike, which is um, for gravity parks and a lot of descending, not good climbers, heavier weight, a lot of suspension travel and super durable bikes. So just wanted to start there with the categories of bikes that you're going to see. And now you're seeing like blurring of lines between all of these categories that, but these are your basic categories, but you're, you're starting to see down, down trail bikes and <clears throat> blurring of the lines between enduro and trail and blurring of the lines between XC and trail based on improved geometry. And you can do so much more with a, a tr uh, XC bike that has a short travel suspension because of the modern geometries now than you used to be able to. And same thing with a trail, uh, but most guys are gonna be looking for a good, what we'd call a quiver bike where um, <clears throat> it, does, it does a lot. And so you're probably looking at a trail bike that you can go do some enduro, pretty heavy duty down. I took my trail bikes into Colorado and do uh, downhill riding in some of the parks there. I don't get into any of the crazy jumps or any of that stuff, but it does just fine uh, in some of those more enduro type environments. So that's a little bit just about laying out the categories for you so you can understand uh, when you see these different categories of bikes you probably want to be looking at a trail bike if you're like most guys. If you're into XC or Enduro, you probably already know that. Uh, but if you're kind of in the middle looking for that quiver bike, looking for that trail bike, uh, you're, you, you, and you see these other types of bikes, you'll know what they are. Okay, now let's get into... Now let's get into uh, the different kind of components and different categories of things you need to think about as you're figuring out exactly what the right kind of bike is for you. So first let's talk about suspension. You're going to have a rigid, a hardtail, or a full suspension. So you don't see any uh, modern rigid mountain bikes unless you're in a niche category uh, like gravel bikes or one of those things. A lot of the really old stump jumpers and some of the first bikes in the mountain bike category were rig what we would call rigid. And then you have hardtail, which is going to be uh, a fork 
in the front that has a sp suspension on it and then no rear suspension. And then you're gonna have full suspension, which is gonna be your fork and your rear uh, end of the bike have a suspension on them. Frame materials on big box retailers like your Walmarts or your Dicks or those kind of things, you're gonna see probably some steel bikes in those guys and some of the much older mountain bikes are gonna be on steel frames. And then your most of your um, lower to mid-range um, decent bikes are gonna be an aluminum frame. And then as you get into the higher end of the market, you're gonna see carbon frames. And frame sizing, you gotta look at the manufacturer's recommended sizing, but generally speaking, you're gonna see small, medium, large, XL, XXL. Here's, here are some of the um, height ranges that you would be, that would put you in the different sizes of bikes. Some bikes are move, some manufacturers like Specialized are moving to S, things like S sizing, where you've got a S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. And it, it is a little bit more about, yes, your height and those things, but your riding styles. So for me at 5'9", I could go to an S3 or an S4, depending on what I wanna do with the bike and how, how much I wanna be able to kind of move the bike around um, and what I like in terms of a cockpit. So there's some of the manufacturers are going to a little bit more variance in the sizing, but generally speaking, if you're medium or large, medium you're looking at 5'2 to 5'10 and large you're looking at 5'10 to say 6'2. XL 6.2 to 6.4, small is gonna be somebody 5.2, 5.3 or under. And then wheel size, uh, we've seen a lot of movement in the industry over the last few years on wheel size. 26, you're gonna see on most your older mountain bikes and more modern bikes are gonna have a 27.5 or a 29, 29er. Those are the modern wheel sizes. Uh, so you're going you're gonna to see those out there as the modern wheel sizes. Some of the downhill bikes today, I think, still have the 26-inch wheel size, but 26-inch um, is, uh, is going to have less rollability than a 27.5 or 29, meaning you just can't roll over the same size stuff that you can with those bigger wheel sizes. 27.5 is going to have a little bit better um, acceleration and be a little bit more nimble and your 29 inch wheels man I just feel like you can roll over anything with a 29 inch wheel so maybe a little bit less um, uh, acceleration than a 27.5 and a little less less nimble on the 29 but man you can just you can just roll over anything on brakes you're gonna go from uh, rim brakes, which is your, your V brakes, or those kind of things where it actually has a pad that squeezes down on your rim on the older bikes. And then you're gonna get into a mechanical disc brake, which is cable actuated disc brake like you would find on a motorcycle. Hydraulic disc, which is uh, the higher end of the market. You're gonna get into the hydraulic disc brakes and you're gonna have a dot fluid or a mineral oil. The two big manufacturers, SRAM and Shimano, um, SRAM has dot fluid, which I don't, I don't like dealing with it as much. You, you can get it on your paint and stuff and it's super corrosive. So you have to do a really good job cleaning up and it also is susceptible to moisture when you're storing it and those kind of things. Whereas mineral oil, it's, it, it's not a huge deal if you get it on your paint, you do want to clean it up when you're done, but it's not susceptible to, uh, mo acquiring, it, it won't like take on moisture. So it's, you can store it a little longer and it's just a little easier to deal with. You're gonna see that in the Shimano uh, brakes, which I like. Drivetrain, you're gonna have a three by, a two by, which are gonna be on your older bikes, which means you have three uh, chain rings in the front or two chain rings in the front, and then your cassette in the rear of the bike. So modern drivetrains are gonna have a, what, we're, what the industry calls a one by which means you have one chain ring in the front and uh, 11, 10, 11, or 12 um, gears in the back of the bike. It's a beautiful thing because you get rid of that front derailleur, you get rid of the shifter, an additional shifter in your cockpit, which both give you weight savings, but it's also one less mechanical thing on the bike that you have to maintain. So you get to ditch that whole front derailleur 
uh, which is which is really awesome and you get to ditch that shifter so you only have one shifter that you have to worry about on the one by modern drivetrains and i'll tell you when you're breathing through your eyes and you're you're on a trail and you're trying to think about gear combinations working two shifters having one shifter and e only having to think about do i want to go higher or lower in terms of my gears is really nice just to have that one shifter and then your modern bikes are going to have a 12 speed 11 speed or 10 speed with that one by combination axle types and sizing uh, the older bikes are going to have a dropout where you loosen the the axle and drop the wheel out more modern bikes have a through axle which means the axle goes through uh, the wheel hub and and you've got non-boost versus boost versus super boost within the more modern axles. And I'm gonna actually take you through one more slide after this that will tell you exactly what that means. And then the major uh, component brands that you're gonna see out there, still the, the big boys are Shimano and SRAM. For Shimano on their lineup, as you're out there shopping, Dior is the bottom of the market, SLX, XT, and XTR are um, the, the kind of graduations to the higher end of the components for Shimano. SRAM, you start out at an SX, you move to an NX, GX, X1, X, X1, which is cross country, and then X01 uh, at the high end. And you, you basically shed weight and um, you get a little better materials and you get even wireless shifting up at the high end of the, the range for both these um, component makers now. So now let's move on. I want to just, I want to jump to the next visual and we'll talk about axle types and sizing. Okay. Another sip of our adult beverage and let's talk axles. So. On your older bikes, you're gonna have a dropout axle with a quick quick release type axle on it. Um, it. As you can see, it's probably like nine millimeters or less, depending on the bike, um, and a hundred millimeters wide for your front axle, and then something like 135 and 10 millimeters for the rear. But these pop loose and then um, you, you drop the wheel out of the bike. The more modern bikes are going to have a through axle, which as you can see from the visual here, it's much thicker and it slides through the hub of the wheel. And so within through axle, modern, uh, the, the through axles that are more modern, you've got non-boost, boost, and super boost. And so these things are really important because they've, they've, um, allowed more stiffness and width in the hubs and so you can get a wider chain ring in the back of the bike and you get more stiffness in the hub so on the non-boost it's uh, 100 millimeters in the front uh, width and then it's 15 or 20 mils uh, in terms of width of the um, or diameter of the axle. So you can see much thicker than the old style quick release. So um, that's a huge advantage in terms of stiffness and durability. And then on the rear for your non-boost modern through axle is 142 and 12 millimeters wide. The most modern bikes are gonna be boost. Uh, most of the trail bikes are moving to the boost and Anything that's probably, say, less than <clears throat> four or five years old is going to have boost or super boost, most likely on the mid to higher end of the market. That means you've got 110 width in the front, uh, same thickness, and then you've got a 148 um, for the back on the boost, and it's 12 mil thick, so it's a little wider. Uh, in terms of the width of the hub and the axle and the same thickness as the non-boost. And then on the super boost in the rear, you've gone to a 157, which is even wider and the same um, diameter or thickness of the, of the axle. So these, uh, the, you'll see these out there and you're gonna find yourself wondering what is, what is boost versus non-boost versus super boost. 
um, and what do the different millimeters mean? You get, you get more stiffness and you get a wider hub uh, with the more modern axles, which does helps with just um, rideability and durability, but also allows you to put a, a wider uh, crank set or cassette on the rear of the bike to allow for eliminating that front derailleur and having more gears in the back so you don't give up any range. Okay, so now let's talk about let's talk about new versus used modern, what I'm calling used modern and used dated. So let's call let's call um, anything new straight from the factory, straight from the shop, straight from the manufacturer. Used modern is going to be one to five years old. And then you might pick that up as a demo or you might buy it on the used market. Um, you can get a demo bike from a bike shop uh, that's a, a year old or maybe some, in some cases a two year old or um, you find that on the, the, you find a one to five year old bike on the open market and then used dated, which is going to be six plus years old. And so you could probably argue these classifications, but basically what you're going to find is um, lower price point on the used old, six plus years old, middle of the road on the used modern. I will tell you a one or two year old bike is not that much cheaper than a brand new bike. You're gonna get a little bit of savings on a demo bike or a one or two year old bike, but these bikes, especially right now during COVID with all the people coming into the market for the very first time, bikes are holding their value incredibly well. So. You, you don't get a ton of price savings on a demo that's been a used used bike for, that's been used as a demo for by the bike shop or some manufacturers actually sell demo bikes um, like uh, comical I think does that conical um, and so you, you're not going to get a ton of price savings on a one or two year old bike as you get more towards the you know four or five year old used modern bikes you're going to get a little bit more price savings versus factory new. Rideability, the geometry has changed a lot, the brakes have changed, the, the um, weights have changed, and so as you go from used, dated, six plus years old, uh, maybe a hardtail to a, a full suspension bike, to used modern, um, to new, it's just, they're it always improves. The, the industry is always improving. It's incremental improvement, but it is improvement. And so uh, a brand new 2021, 20, 2020 bike with updated geometry, updated suspension components, uh, really good braking, is just a drop post. It's just the rideability is just so much better on a new bike. Don't get me wrong, the, the, um, I'm gonna show you a 2014 versus a 2021 stump jumper from Specialized when we get the bikes on the rack. You will see that like, man, a, a, a seven year old stump jumper uh, Specialized is still a really, really rideable and nice bike. But you just, it's gonna get better as you get newer. Forward compatibility is a big thing. We've talked about the axle standards and those things, but as you, the, the bike, the industry is slowly updating the different standards. And so as you go older, six plus years old, it gets harder to find spot uh, parts if you're working on, on a, maybe a big box bike that you got on a big box retailer or, um, uh, suspension parts and those things, they might be harder, become harder to find as you get older and older and, and you're less forward compatible. So I would love to put um, a modern rim that's more stiff and a little wider and that on the 2014 stump jumper, but it's on non-boost. So now, you know, even at seven years old, it's starting to, um, not have as much forward compatibility. Whereas a brand new bike is gonna have forward compatibility for seven years, six years, five years, something like that. Buying experience, if you guys have been out there shopping, it's different right now with COVID, but it's great to be able to go into a bike shop and ride 
four or five different bikes, have somebody that is knowledgeable, hopefully talk to you about the bikes and kind of walk you through what are you looking to do um, and show you some different brands. They're gonna be limited to the brands that they sell in that store. Most bike shops are gonna have three or four brands, uh, but they can give you um, some comparison and contrast between the brands and walk you through what it is that, that they're doing, um, each of those brands, the strengths and weaknesses of those brands. Used modern and, and used, if you're buying a used bike at a shop, that's similar experience. If you're buying a demo, same experience. If you're buying um, used dated, it's like not, you can run into like some, some bad experiences on Craigslist and those things, it's sold. Uh, the, the seller is not motivated to spend a lot of time with you. Um, they may be irritated by all the people calling and texting them. You may see some, uh, every time I, I am shopping for bikes on Craigslist, I always see at least one or two obvious fraudulent list, listings. Um, they're easy to spot. I may do a whole nother video on that, but you never know what you're going to get and you're dealing with the open market, uh, with the used dated. So or the used modern, so it's a, it's just it's nice to go into the bike shop and ride a bunch of different bikes. It's different right now with COVID, but something to, something to think about is the buying experience. So next is service. Depending on how old the bike is and how good the seller has kept up with it, the more service you're going to need. So what I highly recommend is that you go out to the manufacturer's website. If it's a big manufacturer, they will they will have the um, service intervals in the user manual. You can find that information, figure out what service should have been done on that bike, try to get from the seller what has been done, and then you can use that as a negotiation point. You're gonna think about things like your front and rear suspension because the fluids got have to be serviced on that and the seals, your suspension pivots, your brakes, they need a bleed and a fluid change on, on some level of intervals. Your hubs, your bearings, all those things need lubrication and service. And so depending on how old it is, get that information and use it as a negotiation point with the seller to, you can also ask your local bike shop what they charge to do those things. Lots of good information out there on how to do those things yourself, but use that information as a negotiating point with the seller. I will tell you right now, it is a seller's market out there. And so they may be unwilling to negotiate at all on the price point because the bikes are, are just moving so fast that they may not need to do that. But in a normal, bar, uh, normal market, these are good negotiating points for you. And then in terms of consumables, which... Uh, are the things that are just going to wear out on the bike that you need to think about replacing. You can visually inspect them, um, but these, these are the kind of things that are expected to wear out on the bike that you're going to have to plan on replacing if you're buying used dated or used modern. And that's going to be your tires, that's going to be your brake pads. The modern uh, disc brakes have pads or the older bikes have rim pads, uh, but Regardless, you're gonna to have to replace your brake pads and depending on if those have been done or not, you wanna think about that. Your drivetrain and your front, uh, your cassette, rear cassette and your chain and your front ring, all those things actually really wear out. And so you need to replace your chain on some interval. They've got, we've, there's a um, tool from, uh, that you can use to figure out if your chain is stretched too far and you can visually inspect some of the drivetrain to see if it just looks wear, worn out, but you're gonna have to replace those things. And so calculate that when you're making a decision between used, used modern and new. And then things like your grips and those things, you can just kind of visually see, are they worn out on the bike? But those are the, those are the fun things also to replace and that you can do with relative ease on a used bike. So that's a little bit about how you should think about navigating used dated versus used modern versus new. All right, so let's let's talk about one of the, the, the funnest parts of this whole process, which is the shopping for the bike. So 
One of the really interesting developments in the market for me is the rise of direct to consumer brands. So if you're the kind of um, writer that has uh, some tools in the shop and you can you know, work your way around a bike, um, this is a great option because you can get the bike shipped directly to the, the house and do a little bit of assembly and have a really nice bike and you can get some savings here because you are um, buying direct from the manufacturer. So this is just a handful of the direct to consumer brands that are out there right now. YT Industries with the ISO, which is three grand uh, to six grand price point. You got Canyon with the Neuron, which is 1900 to six grand in terms of price range, depending on how it's kitted out. Uh, you got Comnicle, which is 2300 to 5200 with the Meta TR. You got Intense with the Primer 29, which is on the higher end uh, at four grand to uh, 5700 uh, $5, bucks. So just a handful of brands here, but this is really interesting to me because lots of value here that you're getting uh, by having that come direct to you and doing the assembly yourself. And so check these brands out. There's a bunch of them out there for your consideration, but I highly recommend taking a look at these. There's also, um, it used to be pretty, pretty locked down in terms of online re retailers and being able to buy decent, spec decent brand bikes a lot of the big manufacturers still don't sell their bikes uh, direct to consumer you have to buy it through a shop but some of the the uh, websites and and companies that are selling direct to consumer uh, in terms of the bikes and frames are competitive cyclists backcountry uh, Wrench Science, Jensen USA, and Worldwide Cycle Cyclery, which is a, on the little bit higher end of the market. Um, but those those are places you can shop for new bikes that'll ship it right to the house. There, there's others out there. This is this is kind of like really important during the pandemic because uh, your local bike shop might not have any bikes or they may only have one, uh, kind of brand that they've got some inventory on, or you might have to bump sizes, which is not ideal. If you're going to spend, uh, between two grand and three grand or four grand on a bike, you don't want to have to, you want the exact right size for you. So this can open up your options a little bit. This is a way to save a little bit of money and get a little bit more bike uh, for your money. You can also look at outlet on any of these places. I will tell you inventory is thin everywhere right now during, uh, as I'm making this video during the pandemic, but these are some really good options beyond just shopping used on Facebook marketplace, um, eBay, um, uh, pros closet and those kind of places. This is an option to buy a new bike that is really nice spec and a lot of value for the money. All right, first up on the stand is the 2021 Specialized Stump Jumper Alloy. This bike retails for $2,200. I think they actually just raised the price to $2,400. But let's do a quick walk around and see what you get new for that kind of money. The first thing is, I want you to notice the geometry. So you've got a very, um, a, a really nice seat tube angle and a really nice head tube angle so that you have a nice kind of modern geometry. It's nice and stretched out. You've got full suspension. You got 140 millimeters of travel in the front here with the rock shock. And then you've got 130 millimeters of travel in the rear here. And you've got um, nice big disc brakes, hydraulic disc brakes. You got a 203 millimeter in the front and you've got the boost axle standard. So um, you got the boost in the front and the rear. You've got a nice modern drivetrain. So you've got a one by 12 in on the drivetrain here. I upgraded the drivetrain on this bike to uh, the dub bottom bracket, but um, what you what you really need to know is that you've got a nice one by 12 drivetrain. That means no front derailleur, no shifter on the left side of your handlebar, and um, nice 
simple to maintain. You don't have to, you, you lose the weight associated with the front derailleur and the shifter. And um, you only have a derailleur in the back, which makes it easier to work on, makes it lighter. And it's just, uh, you don't really give up much because as you can see, this is a huge cassette that they're able to fit with the boost size axle uh, on this bike. And so you've got 12 gears in the back which gives you plenty of range um, as compared to having like a two by two by or a three by drivetrain where you have to worry about a front derailleur. So this also has tubeless tires, which are really nice, which means no inner tubes on this bike. You've got sealant in your tires, which prevents flats and also reduces weight. You've also got a dropper post, which you click the little lever in your cockpit and your seat post drops down. That's really nice to get it out of the way if you're descending um, or some people when you're climbing, when you're taking it in and out of the car maybe or transporting it, sometimes it's nice to be able to drop your seat post. So you've got a 29 inch rim on this. Um, and you've got a 2.4 width tire in the back and a 2.35 um, in the back. So nice uh, width tires, tubeless tires, lowers the ro rolling resistance, just a nice upgrade all the way around. So that's what you're getting for $22 to $2,400 new. So next, let's get a modern, what I would call a modern used bike on the stand all right here's our next bike we're going to take a look at again this is a specialized this is a 2014 stump jumper comp alloy frame um, so you've got a really similar bike here but it's like seven years older but you can see similar travel on the suspension a little bit smaller disc in the front and not the boost um, width axles. So even on a seven year old bike, you're getting um, a little farther away from the current standard in terms of uh, in, in terms of the axles and things like this. Uh, you can see this one has external cable routing instead of the internal cable routing. The other bike I just showed you had the 2021 um, nice full suspension bike, seven years old, still rides great, but um, I just updated the drivetrain on this bike to a one by. So I went from the two by uh, eight or nine, I think in the back to a one by uh, 12. So I modernized the drivetrain on this bike, which was a little, it gets, starts to get a little tricky because these uh, rear cassettes kept getting wider and wider, and this isn't the boost um, with axle. So you're starting to get a little bit farther away from the modern standard. But this is a no dropper post on this bike. You could put one on this if you wanted to, but didn't come with a dropper post. So you're starting um, in, a, in just a little bit less steep in terms of the geometry, a little less modern geometry on the <clears throat> suspension. So still a really, really rideable and fun bike. You're probably gonna pay somewhere close to $2,000, somewhere between probably $1,600, $1,700, and $2,000, depending on what the spec is, what the components are on the bike. So um, if you can find one, the, you know, it's, it's hard to find them right now especially but if you can find a good used one the things you need to start thinking about on a bike this age seven years old there's a good chance unless you just had an obsessive previous owner that your front shock hasn't been serviced your rear shock hasn't been serviced your suspension pivots um, all need to be um, serviced at some point or replaced um, some of the things are starting to need a good lube in terms of your hubs and different things that take uh, lubrication on the bike. And so this bike, depending on what the previous owner has done, is due for li very likely going to be due for some service. But it's also a point of um, you can negotiate around what I would what I suggest 
as we've talked about is look at the manufacturer's website, see what the service intervals are, are for the bike, and then see what the pre previous owner has done. And you can use that as a negotiation. What I'll tell you is it's really expensive to service your both your shocks and go over your full suspension and do all the pivot points. So take a look at what your local shop would charge you to do those things to the bike. Take a look at what the manufacturer's expectations are in terms of what service has been done on the bike. And you can use those to negotiate with the previous owner uh, on the bike on the price point. All right, so I thought I would throw this hardtail on the bike stand too. This is a little bit um, smaller wheel size. You got a 26 inch wheel on this versus the 27.5 or 29. You've got a mechanical disc brake, so it's cable actuated. I think you can probably see that right there. It's cable actuated. Smaller rotors on that. This is a dropout axle, so this is the um, this isn't a through axle, but this is a dropout axle, so that that drops out here instead of going through the axle. You've got um, it's hardtail. You've got a front fork, which is like an off brand, or you'll probably that's a specialized fork so you don't have a rock shock or a fox for, uh, fork on this bike no rear suspension and a little less modern drivetrain you've got a three by eight drivetrain on this bike so you've got the front derailleur that you've got to maintain and service along with another shifter on your uh, cockpit no dropper post um, this is probably steel frame, maybe might be alloy. Let's see, this is um, aluminum frame, uh, but you've got mechanical disc brakes, a little less modern drivetrain, 26 inch tire. You're gonna see this bike out on the marketplace between, um, this is, a, this is a, a youth bike, but you're gonna see something like this in the $800 to $500, $400 range, depending on the condition of the bike. This one needs a servicing on the front fork, um, probably needs some tune-up. This is running tubes uh, in the tires versus the tubeless setup, uh, and it's got the dropout axles on it. But this gives you an idea of what you might see for a hardtail out in the marketplace. So here's the last bike that we're gonna look at. This is a 21 year old, um, 22 year old probably, Diamondback full suspension bike. This, this was actually one of my very first bikes. My brother-in-law has had it for 15 years probably. And I can tell you that a bike like this, you'd see out on the marketplace for maybe 300 or under, 400 or under, depending on how well it's been maintained. You've got a three by, um, drivetrain on it, decent components for the time. You got a spring actuated um, full su rear suspension on it. You got a front fork that has probably never been serviced that needs uh, service. You've got a V brake on it, which is using your rim to stop versus a disc brake, uh, which is, these were great at the time, but um, man, braking technology has really come a long way. You got a much more narrow handlebar uh, on this bike, and you know it's it's this is what you're going to get for three or four hundred um, dollars or somewhere below that. Uh, this was nice components for its day, very dated. Kind of kind of as I get into working on this, it's going to be hard to find parts to service the fork um, and those things. You probably need to lube the. Um, pivot points on the suspension and probably replace the chain and maybe some of the drivetrain. So you're just getting into a lot more service issues around that three or $400 mark, but it's, it's going to get you out on the trail and um, it's, it's going to get you started. So I hope that helps. I hope it gives you a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more confidence on what you're looking for out on the market, how to navigate the market. I can't wait to hear in the comments what you guys are looking for and if you have any more questions. Thanks for watching my video.